Hello semua, selamat sejahtera and welcome to today's podcast. I'm going to be your moderator for today and my name is Regine Yeo Zixian, NIM AB0419803. I'm from batch, batch 56 of Kaha. Today, we are so glad to carry out this educational podcast on the topic of disease or condition that related to the inflammation of uterus. So now I'd like to introduce my group member. First is me, Regine Yeo and then Ethan Lo and Chin Xiao Rong. Now, firstly, me, myself, will be presenting the topic of endometritis and metritis. Okay, first, endometritis is inflammation of the uterine lining that called endometrium, but it can affect all layers of uterus. The uterus is typically aseptic. However, the travel of microbes from the cervix and vagina can lead to the inflammation and infection too. This condition usually occur as a result of the rupture of the membrane during childbirth. So second, metritis is defined as an inflammation of uterus that develop in the immediate postpartum period that occasionally after abortion or breeding. So metritis is inflammation of the uterus due to the bacterial infection, obviously, and usually occurring within a week after a dog that has given birth. It can also develop after a natural or medical abortion, miscarriage, or after a non-sterile artificial insemination. Furthermore, predisposing costs include prolonged delivery, dystocia, and retained fetus or placenta. Like the E. coli is the most common bacteria isolated from an infected u- uterus, like streptococci, uh, staphylococci, Proteus species and other isolated are less frequently. So this is like the short description about the endometritis and metritis. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Yes, Regine, I have a question. Uh, so what are the signs and symptoms of endometritis? And does it have the same sign with metritis too? Uh, actually, endometritis and metritis is kind of like yeah, interrelated. So they do share a uh, similar sign. Firstly, mainly it's like most obvious one, discharge from the vulva that smells bad, like discharge with um, pus or like the pus mixed with the blood, uh, discharge that is dark green or like abnormal color. And, and secondly, it's swollen, like the dove like abdomen, like swollen abdomen. And then dehydration, the skin, yeah, very obvious sign. And third is dark red gums, fever, reduced milk production, depression, lack of appetite, neglect puppies, increased heart rate if the bacterial infection has uh, become like more severe like, systematically. Yeah, I hope I answer your questions. Yeah, very clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more? Yes, I have a question. Um. Okay. My question is, uh, since the symptoms that you said are the same, then are endometritis and metritis the same? Uh, no, actually, technically, they are not the same. Metritis is the inflammation of the wall of the uterus itself, whereas the endometritis is the inflammation of the functional lining of the uterus that's called endometrium. Yeah, uh, but they are like beside each other, so... They are interrelated. They are easily affecting each other, actually. Yeah. I hope I answered the question. Yes, hmm, how yes. about this? Thank you. Uh, what happens if endometritis is left untreated? Oh, okay. If endometritis, right, left untreated, uh, obviously the sign will just uh, become more severe, even worse. Like if the endometritis um, left untreated, the infection may spread it can lead to more serious infection that complications such as like sepsis. Sepsis is like a potentially uh, potentially life-threatening blood infection and of course will lead to infertility. Uh, treatment should be like start as, as soon as the symptom appear, like as stated uh, previously. And yeah, can go and consult a veterinarian uh, much earlier. Okay, very clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, maybe question from Ethan? 
Um, yes. Uh, can I know how to diagnose this disease in detail? <laughs> that is a, like a like a very good question. I it's it's a it's a long way actually. Like firstly, the veterinarian will like perform through the physical exam, and then will include of course include those chemical blood profile, a complete blood count, and then like. Electrolyte panel and urinalysis. This is like all the basics. These tests will like help the uh help the veterinary to determine whether the bacterial infection has spread until which stage, including the bloodstream, whether uh infection where the infection originate from and how dehydrated the dog is to define the stage of infection of endometritis and. You will need to give like uh through the roughly through the history of your dog health also uh, like to the onset of symptom and possible incident that might have precipitated in such a condition. So maybe diagnostic tools like radiograph or ultrasound imaging will help to like, allow the veterinarian to visualize and examine the interior of the uterus for any retained fetus like that. Like excess fluid accumulation too, and abnormal uh, amount of the abdominal fluid production uh, due to the maybe a uterine rupture will also be help in this kind of diagnosis too. A sample of the vagina discharge also should be recommended um, taken from the cytological to view microscopically. Uh, maybe a culture of the... Uh, both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria from the discharge that I had taken um, um, will be used to identify the bacteria populations present in the blood as well as the discharge. And a sensitivity of isolation bacteria will be performed so that the most appropriate antibiotic treatment can be prescribed the best for your dog. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's all. For what I remember. <laughs> all right. I think that's all from me. And thank you so much for all the interesting, interesting questions of you guys. Like next, I would like to introduce our beloved friend Chin to talk about mucometra, hydrometra, and pyometra. The time is yours. Hello and thank you, Regine. Uh, I'm Chin Xiaorong, Mim B0419802525. Today I'm going to talk about mucometra, hydrometra, and pyometra. Basically, mucometra, hydrometra, and pyometra are defined by the type of fluid present in the uterus and the degree of hydration of the mucin. So in mucometra, the uterine content is seromucoid to mucoid. In hydrometra, it is serous, and in pyometra, it is purulent or hemopurulent. Uh, this is the general information about it. So do you have any questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious about it, so uh, I wanted to ask, like, how does it form? Hmm. Um, uterine disease in dogs and cats is often influenced by the hormone progesterone, which prepare a female for pregnancy and also help the mother maintain a pregnancy. However, sometimes uh, things don't go as planned. After a pet is no longer in heat, the high level of progesterone remain for nearly two months and the high level of progesterone will cause the uterine lining to thicken so as to be ready for pregnancy. If there is no pregnancy after several cycles, the uterine lining keeps getting thicker and thicker until eventually some cysts from inside the lining or we can call it cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Those cysts in the thickened lining will leak fluid into the uterus. And in hydrometra and mucometra, the fluid is sterile and there's no infection. Only in pyometra, there will be an infection, which will occur when the bacteria crawl up the vagina through the cervix and then into the uterus. Besides, in pyometra, the uterus sometimes will rupture, which will release large amount of pus and dead tissue into the abdomen. Uh, you have any other question? Yes, I have a question. Um, how do we diagnose them? Mm. Discovering hydrometra and mucometra is very important as the condition lead to decreased fertility and likely increase the risk of developing more severe uterine disease. Unfortunately, two or three stages uh, do not have any significant clinical signs. Uh, 
So the pet owner is unaware that there will be a medical problem. So radiography or x-ray may detect the uterine enlargement, but an ultrasound can tell if the fluid, there will be a fluid in the uterus or may also indicate the type of a fluid. A dog with pure matter may be quite sick, have a bloated belly, vagina discharge, and a poor appetite. Besides, a cytology examination of vagina discharge is an initial and very helpful tool in diagnosing canning pyometra and in differentiating open cervix pyometra from mucometra. Neutrophils, which are often degenerative and present in large amount, are frequently seen on cytologic examination of vagina discharge with pyometra. Lastly, intra and extracellular bacteria may be seen in cytologic specimen. Hmm. Uh, any other thing you are curious about? Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, how about treatment? Is there any treatment available for this disease? Mm, yeah. Uh, medical management sometimes involves using a drug. Uh, we call it Dinopros from the brand Glutalase. Uh, they will help to clean out the uterine content. By the way, it is used to induce labor and at the same time, uh, we believe it helps to eject the excess fluid. However, hydrometra and mucometra can be response slow to this uh, dinopros that lowers the progesterone and sometimes taking a few months. Sometimes vagina infusion of warm saline can help to empty the uterus also. While any stage of the first two conditions can be treated medically, but they will reoccur. Uh, and they will not resolve on their own, and then the pet maybe will maybe will be at risk. Ah. Any other question? Maybe from Ethan. Uh, my question would be like, how about spaying? Does that also count as one of the treatments for pyometra? Um, theoretically, removing the uterus is only way to prevent hydrometra, mucometra, and pyometra but I think it is unnecessary because for pyometra, spaying is the only permanent fix. Pyometra generally occurs in middle age to older female dogs in the six weeks following heat. Like what I mentioned just now, the uterus will fill up with pus, bacteria, and dying tissue on toxin also. Uh, at the same point, the uterus will die, releasing all of this dangerous material into the abdomen. So it is life-threatening emergency. And then a dog or a cat with pyometra must be surgically spayed immediately or she will die. I think that will be all from me. Thank you for listening, guys. And then I'll pass the time back to Regine. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Ethan, for the questions. And finally, finally, welcome to the last guest in the house, Ethan, to tell us about embryo death and repeated mating. Ethan, you may unmute and the time is yours. Hello, and thank you, Regine. My name is Ethan Lao Chu Yong, name B0419-8004. I'll be talking about embryo death and repeated mating. Embryo death may occur because of infection, which directly influences its developing cells because of a hostile environment in the genital tract or due to an abnormality in the embryo. Embryonic deaths then typically occur before or at days 15 to 17, when implantation occurs. Dogs are monoestrous breeders, meaning that they have one breeding cycle per year. However, this can vary between breeds. If a particular bloodline is continuously bred, this will amplify both the good and bad attributes of the breed. Multiple litters also pose the risk of hygiene concerns and deadly viruses and parasites such as parvovirus and hookworm, which are rapidly spread. The mother can be severely affected by malnutrition, hypocalcemia, which gives potentially life-threatening low levels of calcium, uterine infections, and mastitis. Now, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Mm, yes, I would like to ask. Uh, in this disease, what sort of bacteria cause the death of the embryo? Uh, it would be infectious causes that includes common opportunistic bacteria that occasionally may cause infertility, embryonic or fetal death in the female dog, 
brucella canis, virus infections, and occasionally parasites. The normal flora, examples such uh, bacteria isolated from clinically healthy female dogs, it also includes species such as staphylococci, streptococci, which are either alpha or beta hemolytic and non hemolytic, Escherichia coli, Pastorella specimens, Proteus specimens, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, Clepsila pneumonia, Moraxella specimens, and Haemophilus specimens, all of which may be opportunistic pathogens. Now, I hope that answers your question, Regine. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Now, does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Ethan, I have a question. Um, can you tell me what are the clinical signs of repeated mating? Right. Some of the clinical signs of repeated mating will be like eye problems and hearing loss. Um, there's also joint problems such as hip dysplasia, respiratory issues such as in the case for flat-faced breeds, and there will be also other birthing difficulties. I hope that answers your question, Xiaorong. Yeah, very clear. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Is, is there any more questions you would like to oh. ask? Sorry, one more question about the embryo death. I was uh, curious, how is it uh, the, embryo, the death of embryo being like, diagnosed? That's a very good question. Um, the death of embryo, it will be diagnosed through a serology of vein and virus isolation from the aborted fetuses or placentas combined with fetal autopsy that are used to help for diagnosis. Herpes virus isolation is possible for two to three weeks after the primary infection. For serology, paired samples should be taken like around 14 days apart and must be kept refrigerated until it is analyzed. Serum progesterone analysis and ultrasound monitoring are also useful if abortion has commenced. I hope that answers your question, Regine. Yes, thank you, Ethan. Ethan, okay. last now, question from me. <laughs> okay, what's your so, question? Um, how can we prevent repeated mating? Right, this can be done through responsible breeding, which includes being aware of the health issues that affects the particular breed and breeding away from these defects. It will also involve the regular worming and vaccinating of the litter, microchipping, and ensuring that they are supplied with adequate nutrition. I hope that answers your question, Xiaorong. Yes, very clear. Thank you. Okay, that will be all from me. Now I would like to pass it back to Regine. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you, Sarong, for all the interesting questions. And thank you again for all of our special guests today. I hope today's podcast has been very helpful and educational to you. Here's come to an end, and we hope to see you in our next podcast. And thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.